everyone. This is Emily at Happiness and Books. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Bewitched by Edith Wharton. Bewitched is one of the short stories that Edith Wharton wrote and I'm going to discuss this now because it's October. We're going into November and it's a good ghost story. Uh, it's a little piece of gothic literature. It's one of the, the selections that I'm going to be putting into my gothic literature class that I'm developing. Um, but I'm going to give some brief talks about it now, uh, not go into full detail. Small as it is, it's ver a very important story and it, 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 it's actually a good piece of literature to study when you are studying about writing styles and writing techniques. So Edith Wharton, for anyone who doesn't know, wrote many, many popular novels. She's one of the most important authors of her time. She wrote The Age of Innocence. She was the first woman to win the, win the Pulitzer Prize uh, for literature. She wrote House of Mirth. She wrote Ethan Fromm. Ethan Fromm, of course, is an incredibly depressing, depressing, downer novel. <laughs> Brilliant, but, but you know, like you have to be in a mood to read that book. Um, she wrote over 40 novels in 40 years and over 40 short stories, including this, um, this, this, a ghost stories section or, or selection. Um, she wrote one earlier on that was called Men and Ghosts or Ghosts and Men and then uh, had a, like a sort of a compilation of ghost stories and then this other one later on. Which Bewitch falls into. I chose this one because, you know, it's Halloween. I'm doing a lot of witchy type books. I'm doing a class on uh, that I'm developing on uh, Witches of the Literary Canyon and Literature and I love the show Bewitched so, you know, it just felt right to me. Um, you know, I haven't read a lot of Edith, Edith Wharton since I was doing my uh, English degree and my undergrad English degree, which would have been like in the early 2000s. It might have been like 2005, six, no, 2001 to 2006 or something to that effect, I think. Actually, it took me five years. It might have been 2007. Anyway, um, so anyway, this was written in 1926, which for the time, getting these kind of stories was so thrilling. It was like a, you know, a spinoff of um, gothic literature and, and heading more into horror-y, spooky, supernatural-y, paranormal-y type stories. And it was just such a hot thing at the time. Today, it's obviously still as popular, but uh, back then you have to think of the 20s. You have to think of what was going on in the 20s to be getting these kind of stories, but people just ate this up. They loved her stories. And Edith Wharton is very, very much a, a, a brilliant writer. She has beautiful language, um, amazing plays on words, a fun tone in a lot of her writing, even um, even through the, the wit and banter and the dialogue to the prose, even though the, the melancholic uh, aspects of the plots are oftentimes, you know, very humdrum and sad, her writing is amazing. It's so just lovely and addicting. And she is an amazing storyteller. She knows how to tell a really good story. And that's what, what I love about her. Um, I'm trying to think of, there's another short story of hers that I absolutely love that I just read last year. It's the first time I had read it. I think it was called, was it called Pomegranate or something like that? Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, Edith Wharton was writing books at a time, grew up in a time, was writing books in a time when women weren't supposed to be doing much. They were expected to be domestic and look pretty and that's it. So she was living kind of a double life. Um, she wrote her first book at age 14, finished it when she was 15. It was called Fast and Loose. And it was all about the loose morals of, of women and having, I guess, sex before marriage. I haven't read it. Uh, I know about it. Um, so <laughs> actually, I'm really curious to read that. And she went on to, to live this double life. You know, she got married to a person that she really, I, there's rumors if that it was even ever consummated. Um, she was eventually divorced him and but she was always putting on her parties and giving her appearances and doing the societal norm appropriate things but writing in her secret time and often people didn't know about it in fact um, she went into a bookstore at one point when she was in, a, in the big city um, perusing looking for b uh, books whatever the bookstores were like at the time and um, I believe this was before the war uh, and so and it was, in, no, it was in London, actually, in fact. And uh, the, the bookseller 
recommended to her one of her books, not knowing it was her, saying this is what everybody is reading right now in London. And so she, that gave her sort of that motivation because she was very like shy and very like unsure of herself. But that gave her the motivation to go on and write um, the bigger masterpieces, which uh, thank goodness for us that she did. Anyway, we're here to talk about Bewitched. So Bewitched is kind of like a a tale that it's a takes you into the ghostly dark heart of New England and these these kind of abandoned, spooky, sleepy hollowish, creepy, something is not right kind of hills. Uh, the setting takes place in an old sort of dilapidated farmhouse in this rural countryside. Um, the characters are minimal. The story is short. In fact, I can show you. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's got four sections, but they're extremely short sections, obviously. I think I wrote down, well, I have here my notebook. This is my notebook. Whenever I read in Classic Works, I take detailed notes, copy quotes. I write down things that I feel are relevant that I want it to, to add into my coursework or anything like that. So I'll go over my notes with you as well. But um, just to do a quick, quick synopsis, there are other people on here on YouTube that will review the plot, you know, plot isn't the most essential thing about a piece of writing, but the essentials of the plot is that uh, this is a sort of a supernaturally tale, supernaturally ambiguous tale of a potential ghost and a whole bunch of other unknowns, which I'll get into in a minute, um, uh, really about this kind of very uh, eerie, withered, or j just disturbing looking woman, Mrs. Rutledge, who tells some uh, people who are working on her property, like uh, residents um, or like townspeople, that uh, her husband is having an affair with a ghost. Um, a woman who was once engaged to who had died, who was the daughter of the, a man who's working on her property. Um, Aura Brand was the name of the girl who had died. And of course they kind of, uh, one of the men, men that's on the property is a deacon and uh, so there's some, some of that religious element that's brought into it, the the unbelievability of it, and a lot of you know Puritan undertones here. But um, <laughs> so so I'll, I'm going to back up and say this book or story. It's one of those stories where you read it the first time and and you end it, and you're this is what happened to me, and you're like, what the f just happened here? I mean, that's really how I can surmise it. Like, what just happened here? Like, what? You're like, what? Huh? You know, and you're like, got to go back in a second time or go back and look for clues. This is really a story of ambiguity, of unknowns that leaves us with this numerous amount of questions with no answer. So in a way, it's an unsatisfying story because there's no closure there's no answers to our questions it's left open to interpretation now if you go back and you look at it there are hints throughout of certain things but there's just this sort of like litany of just what what was that all about what was this all about that made no sense what was that like and then it ends and you're like is there a part two like <laughs> like you know, it, it's, it's, that's why these are the kind of stories that are interesting for potential uh, analysis is because we don't really know. Um, so the bottom line is that these, these characters um, talk about, is it possible? Is there a really ghost down there? Yada, yada. Um, the, the townsmen, these, these people that have been working on her property, including the father of this dead girl say, well, let's go down there at night and see if we can see this ghost the spirit because mrs rutledge points down uh the hill toward this lake and says oh that's where he's been seeing aura or the ghost or whatever and um so they say oh, okay okay sure you know so they say let's go down there in the evening they go down or at, at night they go down there at night you get kind of that gothic atmosphere with the misty you know pr the sort of that little bit of the the eerie feelings of the the sublime and that amazing landscape that has that really creepy crawly feel to it and the the lake that has you can just kind of see like the mist and the fog around it when well, they go down to this area but it's kind of wintry so there's snow and they see footprints in the snow and they say near the lake but they're not shooed they're like bare feet and they say well there must be a ghost because a human woman wouldn't walk down there with no shoes on so okay there must be a ghost and i guess I don't remember now, it was a cabin or something. There's like a cabin nearby. 
and the, the father of the dead girl, who is the potential ghost, the girl, uh, and these two others, including the deacon, who's there for like any religious, you know, exorcisms that are necessary if something like that comes up, go in there. And this is where things get really weird because the, the father of Orbran goes into this uh, cabin and it's dark. There's no lights in there. And the other two characters stay out. So it's true from the perspective, I guess, of the characters who stayed out. And they, they go in. There's a, a rustle, a tussle, a boom, bang, bang, like of, of things being thrown. And then gunshots. And then the dad comes out like, oh, and he says something really absurd, like that'll teach them not to walk the night or some, some, some comment like that. I'll have to look at my nose here in a minute. And he walks off like satisfied. And the other two are like, what was, you know, <laughs> like, like me, I'm like, what just happened? What was, who did he shoot? Blah, blah, blah. The next scene is the end of the book. The next scene, you know, we get into, um, this, uh, the, uh, a community kind of a gathering, this, man's other daughter who had still been alive up until then suddenly was dying or dead or is her funeral and mrs the creepy kind of mrs rutledge is there discussing discussing it and they, they should make their appearances or whatever and it's left with it, it, it's something about it's something going on with her her health but it's it leaves you with this host of questions like did Miss did he kill his own daughter, the living daughter? Uh, did like what the heck happened? Like we don't ever know. We don't really ever get any answers. So there's all this room to interpret. So well. in retrospect, the story kind of hints of evil, and this list of questions I wrote down in my notes here that came up for me when with the reading. Of, is as follows one of them is this is all through the through mrs rutledge being the one it's her farm property saying her husband is having an affair with this ghost but the way she's described makes my first question is is she the witch is she a witch there's even a phrase in here i think it was the deacon they're down my quotes the deacon said to one one of the other characters when they're discussing the potential of a ghost um, that's what I said. He's bewitched, as in her husband. And but but she's described as someone who you can't really tell her age. I wonder if I wrote down that quote. You can't tell her age. She could be this age or that age. She has spinally spinally fingers. She's described as cold, um, kind of heartless. Let me see if I can pull that passage quote. when she is first described. Um, Prudence Rutledge. She was dressed for occasion in a black calico with white spots, a collar of crochet lace fastened by a gold brooch, and a gray woolen shawl crossed under her arms and tied at the back. In her small, narrow head, the only marked prominence was that of the brow, projecting roundly over pale, spectacled eyes. Her dark hair, parted above this prominence, passed tight and flat over the tips of her ears into a small braided coil at the nape and her contracted head looked still narrower from being perched on a long, hollow neck with a cord-like throat muscles. Her eyes were a pale, cold gray. Her complexion was an even white. Her age could have been anywhere from 35 to 60. And then the way that she acts, you know, the way that she talks, that kind of eerie, puritanical, just religious undertone, um, uh, 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 hints and nuances that she gives. Later, uh, the characters describe they feel a chill when they're standing around her. They feel uncomfortable. Um, it's described she had a thin smile of disdain on her colorless lips. And um, she, brown bony fingers, et cetera, et cetera. So she, so, and then, and then her husband comes out of the house, right? When she's talking to these hired uh, hands or whatever about the potential ghost. And no one had seen him in a while, Mr. Rutledge. No one has known like where he'd been or why they haven't seen him around town so much. So he comes out looking like a corpse, um, pale, like a modern day of what someone might look like who went from healthy to being maybe under chemotherapy, just like withered and suddenly wrinkled and pale and sickly and slow, like he was a walking dead almost is how he's described. Doesn't say much. And that leads me back to the question is, is... Is Ms. Rutledge a, ghost, a witch and has 
some kind of spell on her husband. There's some analysis of this story that there's an undertone hinting of vampires, um, that she's also a vampire, or that this story is about vampires, but it isn't mentioned. I'm not sure how much I agree with that. I I lean more toward uh, the the witchy, the witchy and the black magic kind of a, a feel here. Um, I'm going to have to reread it again after all this analysis and see more what I think. But the husband comes out, doesn't say much. He points, I guess, toward the area where he's been, um, meeting his, you know, the ghost or whatever. Um, there's a lot of talk about hauntings, praying against ghosts, putting in, you know, protections. So that was one of the biggest questions I had is, I wrote down, is she a witch? Um... And what was that all about when the dad of the dead girl went down to the cabin? Who did he shoot? Who was in the cabin? Was it a ghost? Was it his other daughter who was sort of dead the next day? Um, it almost felt like Mrs. Rutledge lured them or coaxed them to go down there for, I don't know if that was all part of a, a reason. Um, is the ghost real? We don't know. Or is that other daughter, Aura, who was... Engaged originally to Mr. Rutledge, and then supposedly she died, and then he re he married this creepy woman, you know, uh, <laughs> and is clearly like unhappy, and everything around her is just like dark and dilapidated. Um, but was that girl Earl really still alive? And he he wasn't having an affair with a ghost; he was having an affair with a real girl, and would go down there. And when the dad went into the cabin, was she in there? Did he kill her for? being a, a promiscuous, you know, if there's a lot of Puritan, Puritan, you know, uh, moral kind of societal expectation going on in the story in this time period, uh, what, she's sleeping with a married man? I mean, we don't know. We don't really know. There, and, uh, and looking at it again for more tips and clues, um, these are the kind of pieces of literature that are good for analysis. Um, and now I remember the first time I read The Awakening by Kate Chopin when I was doing my undergrad degree. And Anyone who's read Kate Chopin's The Awakening, it ends with her swimming out to sea because she'd been depressed, unhappily married, hated her life. And then she had some reflections on her life in the bookends. Well, I remember writing my whole th paper on that to my professor about how she swam back, you, you know, and he, and I would go in into my to his office to talk to him about the book. And he, I remember him telling me, what was this, like 15 years ago, he was telling me, I think it's very interesting that you're in denial about the ending. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, at the end, she she kills herself. She swims out there and drowns herself. And I said, well, are you sure that's what happened? We don't really know that's what happened because it doesn't say. Isn't that the purpose of literature? And he's like, whoa. <laughs> like, he was like, kind of like impressed, I guess, that I was pretty young at the time. That, um, and I, And I said, it's very difficult, especially it was described as a beautiful day, calm waters in that book, to just go out and the human will to breathe. It, like, like if you were to try to go underwater, because she had been shown swimming before, so I believe she could swim. It's hard to keep yourself under there to, to drown, like your, your instinct and panic and brain will take over and make you go to the top. So I feel like, uh, I don't know that there was enough evidence for that. And I, and I think that was supposed to be a tie to like n nature, the expansive possibility of what her life could have been or could be if she left her marriage and she maybe contemplated it, thought about it, had, had an awakening and then went back. I mean, that's the name of the book. And then went back. Who said she killed herself? And then like, like I was the only one in the whole class that interpreted it like that, or at least the only one who spoke up. But when I'm looking at Bewitched, that's kind of uh, what I'm thinking of. I also wrote down... Um, yeah, is there a curse on the town? Is there a curse on the people? Is Mrs. Rutledge a witch? Apparently some people think she's a vampire. I don't know if I go with that. There are a lot of gothic elements in the story as well. The landscape, the heightened emotions. We do get both terror and horror. Um, we get the terror from the suspense of, uh, the, of this kind of scary things or like them getting ready to walk down, like expecting you to run into a ghost in a, on a misty night in the dark, uh, you know, kind of supernatural fear like you get when you watch like the Blair Witch Project or something like that. You get the terror elements, you get the horror elements and horror associates to the grotesque, something that's horrifying to see like a mutilated dog, like on your front porch or something, that would be horrifying. We get some of that horror through the, the disturbing descriptions of Mr. and Mrs. Rutledge. And then um, really though, I would say this bottoms out to be uh, a crossover kind of a genre. I mean, we get the, little bit of the the we have the gothic base the gothic backbone to the story 
we have that kind of crossover into the um you know the horror with the supernatural a little bit of the 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 terror and the grotesque but then we have a kind of another crossover genre into like mystery you know almost I don't want to say like murder. I, I mean, I guess you could, I don't want to say Agatha Christie style, but that's a murder. But there was a murder that happened here, an unsolved murder. It, it's it's a mystery. There's a lot of mysterious, suspenseful elements. Even uh, even if you were to look at it now, it'd be like it would be like a modern day suspense thriller, right? So we have you know all these questions. If you have a, a story you're reading and there's a lot of questions and unexplained things, open to interpretation be it that they are, are concluded at the end or not, that technically falls along the lines of suspense um, or mystery even, which of course those genres have crossovers as well. Uh, but so I think that this story really has a little bit of everything. It has a little bit of, of, in those essences, it has the gothic, it has the horror, it has the adventure and the mystery. Um, not so much the adventure, I'd say the mystery uh, and the suspense and a little bit of a thrill. You get a little bit of a thrill reading it. But I think it's, it's, I enjoyed it. Um, I don't like the feeling of not having things explained. I'm going to read you one of the last passages, which can kind of be assumed that this is a thesis here. Um, Doesn't it seem as if we're all walking right in the shadow of death? In capitals, the shadow of death. Uh, this is the the deacon saying something to Miss Rutledge at the end after that other girl's, I guess, funeral. Um, so I think that line ties into what's real, the theme of this book, what's really going on in this book. Um, so I wrote here, where's that scene I can read you? Yeah, here, see, I, wrote, I, I annotate all my books. I just wrote, what just happened here? This is the cabin scene with the gun. And we're like, what? <laughs> um, he come out. Yeah. Mr. Brand had turned back and was staggering past him out back into the uh, outside, but while with the revolver in hand. Now, this is saying it was daylight. Had it, it was early morning hours. I guess it was on the cusp of being going dark and the sun coming out or something. Anyway, he says, they do walk then. And then he laughed. He bent his head to look at his weapon. Better here than in the churchyard. They shan't dig her up now, he shouted, and then walked away with his revolver. And we're like, did he shoot a ghost, his daughter, Aura? Is that what he means when he says they do walk then? And why would you laugh about that? And then better here than in the churchyard as far as where he shot them. But then the next day, his daughter, his other daughter is dead. So I'm really going to have to get back into this and look at it again. Um, if you're looking at writing any kind of essays uh, about kind of gothic or horror crossovers with uh, mystery or suspense, this might be a good thing to reference in that essay with some quotes. This was an Amazon. I'll link it below. It's a, but it was a really interesting read and I enjoyed it. There's a ton more I could get into here with all the gothic and everything from a literary perspective. I'm going to keep this at what it is and I'll save the rest for my class that I'm in the, in the development of. But Edith Wharton, absolutely amazing. The Age of Innocence is set in the late 1800s. It's um, at a time even more so than when she was alive, like when women had nothing, no rights, no, their life was their husband's life. They were not encouraged to do anything out of the prim and proper, you know, pretty domestic. And um, that kind of time period when things were starting to change in history to the, the suppressed, you know, pretty woman, right? Uh, the, the, we had like the Gregorians and we had the, the Victorians. And then uh, we, and then go, getting into women starting to kind of break out a little bit and maybe explore more sensuality and, um, you know, there's adultery in there, there's divorce, there's all kinds of stuff in that book. So amazing, brilliant. She's a great writer. I can't recommend her enough. Um, I haven't read Ethan from about 20 years, so I can't say I can speak a lot on that. And I know that it, there's a lot of misery in there. Um, Ethan Fromm's life was a life meant to be about death. Uh, I can tell you that. And um, the House of Mirth has a, an unhappy woman, female character who dies, you know, <laughs> so because of her unhappiness as well. So uh, Edith Warren overall, I, I think 
uh, there's a very good documentary too. In fact, I can think of about her that I will link below. They're on YouTube. And um, she was a very unhappy person in her personal life, unhappy relationships until later on when she met a man who brought her out in her sexuality and she started writing, writing some poems. She wrote a lot of poems, you know, sensuality and sexual type poems uh, that didn't, things that did not occur with her first husband um, uh, or with her husband. So, uh, you know, I, but she, a lot of her misery and suppression and I think leaked out, leaks out into her stuff. So anyway, um, just a recommendation for an author and a ghost story for Halloween. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know what you think and I'll see you in the next video.